Welcome to episode two of Just Another Video Game Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Harvey. Joining me for this episode is my good friend, Shane Everling. Hey. How's it going, Shane? Uh, it's not too bad. Just uh, enjoying a nice afternoon. Good, good. Now, there's a reason I brought you on for this episode, and it's dealing with a subject that I believe is one of the reasons that we're friends in the first place, and that's Metal Gear Solid. Oh, yeah. When we worked together years ago, that was uh, that was something that you and I kind of bonded on. Oh, yeah. It's uh, probably the reason I'm a gamer, to be honest with you. I was a casual video gamer until I played Metal Gear Solid 1 and saw, like, wow, games can be as powerful as movies. It, I, I think it, it really changed the dynamic of how developers viewed video games. And it was one of the first games to use take advantage of full-on voice acting. You know, you kind of see, like, in, in AAA blockbuster games today that they actually use legitimate actors now. You know, it's not just, like, uh, second-tier level uh, people you know, no names and stuff like that. People actually hire legitimate actors to do voice work now. Right. The first, well, the Metal Gear Solid game, not really the first Metal Gear games, but Metal Gear Solid was really the first game to make it cinematic, to make it movie level quality cutscenes. Yeah, in and movie, really... yeah, movie level quality writing as well. Right, right, and that really did change the gaming landscape where everyone else had to adjust. Yeah, it, it, it broke the ceiling and it set a new standard. Yeah, I think it had a big, big influence on, on the evolution of, of games from just being video games where it was gameplay first and maybe a game might have a little bit of a story to it to, okay, you know, we got to up the ante and we got to make it a full package, gameplay plus story. It brought them all, almost up to the same level. Right. And jumping ahead to our most recent entry in the Metal Gear series, Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, which personally for me, on a gameplay level, is one of the greatest games ever created. It's almost perfect in terms of an action game when it comes to the solid controls, the fun replayability of the gameplay. The visuals were pretty good too. Not the, not the best, but it suited the game perfectly. Absolutely. Uh, the Fox engine, uh, unfortunately... Uh, it was a very, very expensive engine for Konami to develop. Uh, I, I'm not sure if Konami developed it or if Kojima Productions developed it. Uh, but unfortunately, the only two games that really harness the ability of the Fox engine thus far is Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes and Phantom Pain together, which I just would call the Metal Gear Solid 5 package. Uh, and I think uh, their PES soccer game. So we really haven't seen what it's fully capable of yet, but... It, as far as it being tailored to MGS5, it was absolutely flawless. You're right. Well, I will just say there was uh, there is another game planned using the Fox Engine. That's the Metal Gear Solid Three Pachinko game. Oh yes, of course. We'll, yeah. we'll get we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, get to, to that, that later on. But yeah, the the time that I spent with Metal Gear Solid with Metal Gear Solid Five was some of the most fun that I've ever had in a game. Even though there was a lot of repeating levels. It was so much fun every time, and you just got better and better at it every time you played it. You learned more about the levels. You learned the best way for you to play, and it, you just felt like a badass throughout the entire thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It. Uh, I, I think what really shined through the most for Metal Gear Solid Five was the transition to open world. I really think they did it extremely well. I, I think they... Uh, did a fantastic job on, you know, the attention to detail wasn't lost because most of the time when you go into large open world games, some of the finer details get overlooked. And one thing that Metal Gear was always known for while linear was the obsessive amount of detail that was put into the games. And I really don't feel like any detail was uh, compromised by them transitioning to an open world. True. And as an open world, I never really felt, though, that Metal Gear Solid Five had large maps. But the fact that within each of the maps, you you could go to one base, do something there, and if you went to the complete different side of the map, that was affected by it. And you would have to be on alert for certain things because of what happened on the other side of the map. And you don't really see that 
in open world games in general. Usually when you do something, you just get far enough away from that area and everyone just forgets everything you did. Yeah, exactly. I it, I think that it was definitely a very complex AI system that they integrated into it. And I mean, it, it literally felt like a living, breathing world. You know, that, that was one thing right. that I agree with. Uh, it, everything from the, the weather, while I think some of the weather was kind of li- limited, I think they could have done more, you know, different weather uh, things and effects uh, that would have made things a lot more interesting. But either way, it, it really did feel like a living, breathing world. Talking about more on Metal Gear Solid Five, the story, I've personally, I've never been too invested with the story. I've always just really enjoyed the gameplay of all of the series. The stories, they never really grabbed me. I Most of the times I would end up confused by the things that they would do by the end of it. And this one, it didn't really do that to me, but that's just because I didn't think that in, in comparison to the other Metal Gear Solid games... The story was really light in this one, and it didn't do anything too crazy in comparison. Uh, the twist was rather, was kind of a big, that that was the only thing. That was it, was the the, the plot twist at the end, you know, um, and I, I don't know if you want to do spoilers or not. <laughs> I mean, the game's been out for almost a year at this point, but uh, I, I won't, I won't uh, comment on what the big twist at the end was, but that was the only portion of, you know, story-wise, that was the only portion of the game that, that really shifted a lot of pieces that impacted the entire timeline. Yeah, for me, with the twist at the end, I'm not going to bring it up because I don't find it that important to the whole game. I think that the importance of that lends more to the other games that take place further on in the timeline. Okay. And not so much Metal Gear Solid V. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah. From from a person who is a fan of the entire series and loves it from beginning to end, uh, as messy as it is, and and kind of like <laughs> what you said, the the fact that the story can be confusing, it, kind of a general rule of thumb is is trying to frantically understand the Metal Gear Solid timeline and and conspiracies and all that stuff. Uh, can be more infuriating than it is rewarding. So anybody who's out there that is a little confused is just kind of like, wait, what? Who's what? Who's aligned to who? Who is double crossing who? Don't don't feel don't feel left out because pretty much uh, I would say that eighty five percent of people that love Metal Gear are in that boat. Yeah, fortunately the games never test you on any of that. No, no, they do not. <laughs> But during the development of Metal Gear Solid V, there was some drama going on be- between the lead production company, Konami, and the lead director, creator of the series, Hideo Kojima. There's a lot of stuff that we don't really know. There's a lot of stories about what was going on in there. You can look at what Konami was putting out and realize that they didn't really care much about game development at that time they were more so focused on as i was talking about earlier their pachinko slots which um for those that don't know are basically uh, pinball machine type things uh mixed with slot machines that are really big in japan konami made it clear that they really wanted to focus on that because at the time they were making more money off that when in game development specifically with metal gear solid 5 there was a lot of money that was just getting thrown into it but no results were coming out because the game won't make money until it releases correct and so we hear these stories about what's going on we still don't know what's actually happening the game finally comes out the news got out before that that the game was incomplete right absolutely it was and um, a lot of people were wondering, well, what does that mean? You know, how, what do you mean the game is being released incomplete? Are we getting something later? We find out through playing the game that they did put their own ending on there, but that there was sort of a, a third act that really wrapped up a lot of stuff. And that, that goes back to what I was saying before about how I would get confused about a lot of things. If you look into that, you can find sort of the test videos and the incomplete videos of the cutscenes, and you can get a lot of answers for things that they never really ended up addressing in the final game. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know that chapter three, there, there was supposed to be a potential chapter three called Peace. There's like no context to what that would have been. Nobody even, like there's not even a, a context to like what Kojima was wanting to do with chapter three. And as far as like what it was, there even going to be an arc on the story? Was it just going to be a collection of missions? Was it going to, you know, was chapter three meant to be like a FOB multiplayer integrated type situation? So yeah, chapter three is, is a complete mystery. Uh, nobody really knows what was going to be involved in that. Uh, chapter two, which is just a bunch of random replayed missions on a harder setting, essentially. Uh, and there's some extra, you know, unique missions that weren't in Chapter 1 in there as well. But there's just a bunch of random events in Chapter 2, and it's called Race. And there's no theme of race throughout Chapter 2 at all. <laughs> Nothing. Right. If it wasn't for the amazing gameplay, I would have been really upset with the game at that point and may not have even finished it because of the fact that it was just making you replay variations of missions you've already done absolutely i mean in the in literally the only difference is like I, I there's some that just have like a some of the missions literally just have a harder difficulty setting you know that the guards can spot you from farther away um right noise that you know they hear better you know things like that and then i think there's uh, some of the missions that they don't really jack up the the difficulty setting per se like the the awareness of the guards but like there's a extra there's an extra thing thrown in like if you get spotted the mission's an automatic failure like you have to do it in complete stealth so either way like you said either a variation of the mission or a subsistence mode of the mission where it's just you know it's it's harder to hide basically right so there's a lot of information that goes out after the game is released on what was happening there was definitely sort of a feud going on between Kojima and Konami. Specifically, I believe it was the, the president of Konami that the president of Konami. Basically there was a feud between them. They were mistreating him. They were forcing all these things that he didn't want to have in the game. And um before the game even released, we were told the uh, information was let out that uh Kojima was going to be leaving Konami. And even at the time that that information was released, Konami denied it. They were saying things like, oh, he's just on vacation and tried to pretend like these things that were going out of like farewell parties weren't happening. And it was it was all very weird. Yeah, it was extremely weird because, it, I mean, obviously, look, there's a culture gap between us and, and uh, Eastern culture countries, you know, Um American culture is nothing like Japanese culture. There's a totally different set of standards in the professional environment than there is here. Um, so naturally, we would, you know, we would leave, you know, more questions and, and misunderstandings of like why is Konami doing what they're doing. The 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 main like all the crazy stuff that happened like oh no he's just on vacation and you know uh, th there was no goodbye party. Uh, I mean, look, it was obvious to everyone, no matter what culture it was, that Konami had basically severed their relationship with him because um, Metal Gear over the years has been, I, I would I would venture to say that's been Konami's flagship franchise. Well, it's the only it's the only one that they've done anything for for a long time that some of the other series that they uh, own the rights to they were basically giving them out to other third parties to just try their hand at some variation of what the game was. And we've, we got mobile versions of certain games. There were a lot of Castlevania games that were put out for like, it wasn't handled by the original developers of it, who they had their own issues in, with Konami in the past and had left and done their own things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When I look at Konami as a whole... They have three AAA IPs that can really uh, make a make a really good sales result for them. Castlevania, and then you got Silent Hill. Silent Hill is their horror franchise, which um, you know that's a big deal. And of course, Metal Gear um, is their like I don't know action their action uh, genre game. But 
those three IPs are loved and heavily respected in all of the gaming communities. You know, there's a lot of developers out there that only have one calling card or don't even have that one calling card. They're trying to make their names known. You know, it, it for the fact that Konami is a is a you know entertainment provider, whether they're just publishing or they're actually developing it in house. You know, there's a lot of game companies that would kill to have three IPs that are as, as well established as Konami. And you're right, Metal Gear Metal Gear is the only franchise that has been getting you know meaningful entries over the last I would say oh five years you know maybe seven years I, I would I would put Peace Walker in that window as well and a lot of that of course had to do with the fact that Kojima had his own production studio under the Konami brand but the Konami has just kind of let Silent Hill go to the wayside with some shoddy entrances and uh, into the franchise and the fact that they're they I know that they have contracted out outside development studios. Uh, I think the Silent Hill 4, for example, I believe was developed um, by a contracted developer and they just published it. And Castlevania, I've like the, the latest entry of Castlevania, I've got, I've heard mixed opinions about. I know some people are like, oh gosh, it's absolutely horrible. And then I've heard some people be like, ah, I kind of enjoyed it. So yeah, they, they, they're either way on two of their three flagship IPs, they've definitely the, they've trended downward in the quality department. And they're not putting as much care into it. So after Metal Gear Solid Five finally released to critical acclaim, I mean, there are very few people out there that hated the game. Like, if you didn't like it, it was just not your kind of game. If you enjoyed action games, most people absolutely adored it. It was an amazing game, even even with missing content. I still put at least 80 hours into that game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I put over 100 myself. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it, gameplay-wise. It, it was the probably the most polished one that I've ever seen uh, from the series. And to be honest with you, I know there's, there were some really, really good games that came out in 2015. Fallout, for example. I know Witcher 3 got a lot of high praise as well. But as far as just the all-around, everything was balanced. You know, you very rarely see that, especially in an open-world approach. Right. So... Around the time that the game comes out, Konami says that what I was saying before about how they weren't interested in focusing on the console video game market. And everyone just assumed that we weren't going to really be getting any more games from them. The E3 following that, they didn't have anything. I believe they had their soccer game and that was it. So everyone was just under the assumption that Konami's out of it. They're not going to be developing games they're not going to be publishing real games they're going to be focusing on their pachinko slot games and just recently we got a trailer for the next metal gear game that's metal gear survive so not not a metal gear solid entry but it does take place in metal gear solid 5 it takes place it takes place in the the, the context of Metal Gear Solid 5, I think. Um, you can't even say the Metal Gear Solid 5 universe because the, the trailer shows and even Konami has confirmed that they get sucked to a parallel d dimension. So you can't even say that it takes place inside the universe <laughs> because... Uh, I, I could say that. I, 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 I believe that this is going to be canon. I don't think it's going to add anything to the story because... Yeah, the, the beginning of it, we see Big Boss, we see the events at the beginning of Metal Gear Solid 5, and, but then we see Big Boss and the important characters fly away on a helicopter. Meanwhile, we get these little, these low-level grunts get sucked into a wormhole, which there were worm, wormholes in Metal Gear Solid 5 if you found the right technology, so that's, that's already canon. And they get sucked into an alternate dimension where there's zombies, but we kind of already had zombies. These are just different kinds of zombies. And so are you treating this as canon from what you've seen so far? It's, uh, wow. Um, <laughs> it's I mean, a tough question. it's a tough question. I mean, the fact that it's, I mean, okay, look, for argument's sake, the destruction of the original MSF base happened in Ground Zeroes, 100% canon. Um, 
uh, stranded soldiers getting sucked through a fucking wormhole and sent to a, I don't know, like, the the closest thing I can compare it to from what I've seen so far is, like, uh, Land of the Lost. I don't know if you remember that old television show where the family was in the SUV and then they, like, got uh, an earthquake happened and they fell into the earth and then there was, like, a portal that took them to, like, a weird parallel universe where dinosaurs still existed and there were weird things going on there. And even, like, the the uh, new, like, re- reboot of not the series, but, like, a movie with Will Ferrell in it. I don't know if you ever saw that. It had uh, Will I Ferrell and Danny one. McBride. Uh, it just, like... You know, that there's some kind of weird, like, overflow dimension where uh, just a bunch of things from a bunch of different worlds just fall into it, you know? Uh, that That's the closest thing that I can literally, like, compare in modern-day media and entertainment to what this is. It, it, it's, it, I mean, because you're literally, it's, it, they're taking the Metal Gear Solid Five, you know, gameplay controls and... I'm sure there are going to be some additions. They, they they'll probably tweak a few things for the sake of the gameplay, um, but the, you're going to take the base Fox Engine code technology and you're going to reapply it, but you're going to swing it around to a different cause. It's almost like you're taking Metal Gear Solid Five and and mixing it with Left for Dead. Is is kind of the the vibe I'm getting here. Yeah, I mean, that's what it looks like. You, I mean, you literally have zombies, just like Left 4 Dead. It looks like it's going to be a four-player co-op sort of thing, just like Left 4 Dead. It doesn't... I can't imagine you having the freedom of exploring the giant levels with four-player co-op. A game could do that, but that would have to be a dedicated sort of thing. This is definitely more of a an asset flip kind of thing where... They're taking the Fox engine, they're taking the things they already had during the development of Metal Gear Solid V and making sort of a multiplayer spin-off of this. And that's the that's the whole reason I'm not into it at all. Is I'm not a big multiplayer fan. I never really got into Left 4 Dead. If the game retains that amazing the amazing controls that metal gear solid 5 had if it retains the fun of taking over bases with multiple people if i could get some of my friends that were into this game like if you and i could literally jump in to metal gear solid 5 and play with each other and like plan out how we're going to take over a base that i'm all on board but the fact that there's going to be zombies in this means that we're not going to be we're probably not going to be de- uh, dealing with intelligent enemies. So you're not really going to have to be worrying about strategy and getting somewhere. Right. Yeah. It, uh, it's just not metal gear a- at the end of the right. day. I mean, this is not what metal gear is, but at the same time, up until metal gear, solid five, uh, parasite infected, um, freaks of nature that turn soldiers in their presence into mindless zombies themselves, uh, wasn't exactly Metal Gear, but even with that, you know, uh, Metal Gear, one thing that's always been great about Metal Gear is when there's something that's, like, weird or unexplainable or, or almost science fiction-ish, um, the game really does a solid job of trying to scientifically explain how and why. So you see, see the... this thing. I don't. I don't believe we're going to see that in this game because no. that was all Kojima. Mm-hmm. That was all the stuff in his head and like all these stories that he had. I don't think we're going to get really a story at all in this game. I think the the whole thing is going to be broken up by smaller levels, Left for Dead style of getting from one location to the other location at a very. I'm sure there will be some openness to it, but it is going to be a linear format. Yeah, yeah, it definitely will be, and I, I 100% agree. There's not really going to be much scientific explanation, um, and if they do, it might be like at the end of the game of like, oh, the the wormhole opened because of this, or maybe it was something that Skullface had intended like all along. Because, like you said, the the, the technology in Metal Gear Solid Five existed, right? So, in order to like wipe out any survivors, maybe Skullface triggered a wormhole to open above it after the attack was successfully done on the base. We don't know. Konami could uh, maybe shoehorn that in there, and and it would be a a half ass okay go along with it, you know. And and that would if Konami did something like that, it would kind of get more of a nod to be accepted into the canon, I think. 
but this is Konami and, and they, they always find a way to like, you know, not just disappoint you, but like disappoint you in the biggest way possible. Right. <laughs> I mean, when it comes to disappointment baseball, they swing for the fence every time. <laughs> so if this game does come out and it's reviewed well, I'll play it. I'm not going to buy it new. I'm going to find some way to buy it used, some some discount thing. Because even though I believe they said that it's going to be $30, I'm not going to give Konami my money right now. They have not earned the right to get in me, any of my money right now. And for me, it's I'm, I'm still just not interested in it. It's Like I said, I'm, I was never big into the Left 4 Dead. So saying, oh, it's Metal Gear Solid, but Left 4 Dead style, it's like... I would rather just go and start a new game and, and Phantom Pain and just start over again on that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you paid attention to, like, some of the stuff that was uncovered through data mining, uh, Metal Gear Solid Five. Um, but if I, was, if I was Konami, instead of making this, uh, I don't know if you saw that they actually uncovered, like, um, what looked like a level editor for the Phantom Pain. Like you custom, oh, custom no. yeah, custom side ops, and this was actually something that Kojima even discussed a couple years before the game was released. Uh, he he mentioned something about like user generated missions, um, he, and he talked about it like a couple times, and then he never talked about it again. And then of course the game came out and it wasn't there. Um, but if, well, I'll argue that we did get a slight thing with with that in terms of fortifying your base, and people could come in, and there were ways that you could mess with that but in terms of yeah you couldn't design your own campaigns yeah yeah and i i never expected to have the freedom of like your own campaigns i mean that that's pretty uh that that's more along the lines of like fallout and bethesda type stuff where they release the construction kits and people can literally mod to their heart's content on, on games like that but um the the custom side ops thing you know that was something that kojima had actually kind of touched on in some interviews and uh you know, if Konami actually, you know, were to say to finish that co that code up and that development and release it in a patch, uh, or even you know charge ten bucks for like a a mission maker uh, kit or something, I mean, I'd pay the ten dollars for it. Uh, and because I mean, you're talking about like it in, it's already a highly replayable game, but then you're going to you know pump in like user created missions, and I'm sure they could make it to where people can post them online and you can go download them. And I mean, you're talking about extra hours and, and some people would probably, you know, who may have bought the game once turned around and sold it. They'd probably go buy it again, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, I think that would have been the smart thing to do. But then again, this is Konami. They would rather mix it with left for dead two <laughs> and call it metal gear. Well, the thing is, it would be more. It's more profitable for them to release it as a thirty dollar game than if they tried to sell a thirty dollar add on for Metal Gear Solid Five. It wouldn't sell nearly as well. No, it would not. But I so, definitely think they could have sold it at a cheaper price and maybe sold more units to make up for it. But I'm not a salesman and I'm not a financial expert, so I'll leave that one up to the viewers to decide. <laughs> <laughs> so. Regardless of what Metal Gear Survive is, what would you need from a from a new Metal Gear entry to make you want to go along with Konami again? That's easy. And I would say that 90% of the Metal Gear fan base would agree with me. We need a Metal Gear 1 and 2 remake. And I don't know, I, putting them together in one package would probably not be the way to go. And, and this is actually something that leans on Konami's side uh, and would benefit them. They could literally remake Metal Gear 1, and then they could remake Metal Gear 2. And they could sell two full $60 games where the canon, the lore, the events are already wrote out in, in the lore by Kojima himself. Now, this is where they have to be a little careful, is they need, while they you know, obviously had a big falling out with Kojima. If they want to appease the fans, they need to respect his work at the same time. Okay. So, you know, and obviously there is some room for creativity, but things that are already established are the goal of, of that mission 
you know, infiltrating Outer Heaven. Main characters are already established. But I don't know if you ever went back and played the MSX version of Metal Gear 1. Did you ever go back? I played a little bit of it when it was bundled with Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsist- Subsistence. Okay, okay. So um, I've actually gone through and beaten both Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear uh, 2 Solid Snake. I've, I've, I've played them both and, and beat them. Um, Metal Gear 1, primarily... It's it's very very basic. It's such an old school game, for for a game that's known known for like lengthy dialogue and codec conversations and you know cutscenes that like you could literally go pop popcorn and, and finish it before the cutscene's over. For for a series that's known for that, Metal Gear One is actually uh, kind of a uh, anomaly within the series because the game has like it, it, it like a codec conversation in Metal Gear One was, "Hi, this is Jim." Uh, the rocket launchers in that room. Bye. It, it, it was like it, it's like a game that can't wait to shut up, you know. Right. But Outer Heaven, the fortress, is a well-established location in the lore. It was in South Africa. Solid Snake's first mission, you know, big boss, uh, you know. Uh, but you know, it's it's all commanded, you know. So so your basic story structure is there, but there's a lot of wiggle room. There's you can, you know, as you reimagine this. In, in modern standards, these these characters are going to need background stories. These characters are not just going to be allowed to just be over the radio and say, hi, there's the rocket launcher, goodbye. There, While there is some constraints and, and the basic event is structured, there's a lot of room for creativity within the uh, outer heaven infiltration as Solid Snake and, and uh, you know, Big Boss being your radio commander. I mean, there's a lot of room. And a lot of things could be written. You could take the story, you know, different directions. You know, and I just think that there's two main characters in Metal Gear. Big Boss and Solid Snake. One being the clone of the other. Okay, obviously Solid Snake being the clone of Big Boss. And it's like, okay, this is like the biggest crossroads in the entire timeline. It's the two main characters battling it out. Okay, so... And, and this is where, like, the torch gets passed from Big Boss to Solid Snake. How can you not, like, jump on this? I mean, in, in a Metal Gear fan's mind, this literally were the two biggest events for Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2. How can Konami not see, like, the Scrooge McDuck bank of gold coins that he dove into <laughs> with this? I mean fans sure. are are salivating for this and the fact that i mean i kojima's in it for the creativity genius side of it he's not in it for the bottom line so that's why kojima never really went back and had a huge passion to um remake these games and bring them up to modern standards you know if, if konami is it, it, it for all the things that konami are terrible at one thing they're very good at and very very obsessed about doing is making money you know, it's. I mean, this is the only logical direction that Konami can go with it because if they try to reboot this franchise uh, with like new characters and all the other old Metal Gear Solid stuff is its own its own package, and now we're going to go with Metal Gear Dangerous, for example, and they just like there's a new main character and, and totally new setting, new time. That just, I mean, it would flop. It would be a huge flop. Um, if they try to remake the boss, like a game with the boss during World War II, I think some people would would enjoy that. Uh, I I wouldn't mind uh, a boss game, but all this, all of this stuff, takes a backseat to remaking the MSX games. It's the only logical decision that Konami can make, and you know, good for Konami, good for us is, you know, Konami has the opportunity to make a lot of money off these games. And good for us if Konami can actually bring somebody in that will treat the series with care, uh, s- stay true to Kojima's base storyline of the Outer Heaven incident, and is talented enough to see a vision where he can still respect Kojima's timeline, but you know add more in to make it a full functional game that has a story to tell so it, it, it is like i mean if konami goes there and then they just release some 
bucket of crap, they're going to, you know, their bottom line's going to hurt. And, you know, that's basically going to make us go, well, there it is. That's Konami's best attempt at trying to do Metal Gear without Kojima, and they fell on their face. And we just walk away and kind of, you know, have a Metal Gear solid franchise funeral and say, it's been a fun ride, but uh, they can't do it without Kojima. Sure, I, I I get that. For me, I, I like I like your idea of sort of the Metal Gear remake of all that. Although if it doesn't have Hater, then I'm not buying into it. Um, for me, I want Revengeance too. They've already handed it off to someone to a different team to make a Metal Gear game, and they did Revengeance, and I loved that game. It really wasn't like any of the other Metal Gear games. But it was fast paced and it was a lot of fun and it was it was stupid, but it was so great. Uh, when you say stupid, that really doesn't phase any Metal Gear fan because no, no, of Metal Gear not. itself there's, there's a, is stupid. Yeah, there's always a hint of stupid in a lot of the games, but you, and you have those defenders that are just like, no, no, it it all makes sense in the end. But I felt that Revengeance kind of embraced it. And I just, I loved it. I loved that all of the bosses that you fought in there, by to finish them off, you had to chop them into tiny little pieces. But for me, it's just, I'm, I'm not the kind of person that needs a series to continue on forever. I'm okay with Phantom Pain being the end of Metal Gear. I'm looking forward to whatever Kojima's doing next. Hopefully we get something from maybe some other quality developer that looked at Phantom Pain and they said, I want to make something like that. And we can look forward to that being the new standard for open world stealth games. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the fact that Middle, uh, Phantom Pain was the first open world stealth game, uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, maybe like I've never played any of the Assassin's Creed um Maybe maybe that. Yeah, has those aren't world. stealth. You really can't consider those stealth. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, uh, I mean, even like the direct competitor Splinter Cell, uh, they've never done. I mean, it's all linear, you know, missions and stuff like that. So yeah, hopefully they can. And uh, one thing I liked about Rising that uh, you know you mentioned is, you know, it took a different spin, but it's still centered around a, one of the characters from Solid uh, in Raiden uh, that was well respected. And uh, it still kept that, like, odd, quirky Japanese charm, like, with some of its goofiness and, and humor. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, you know, looking forward to it. But, I, I mean, it's time to go back to Outer Heaven. That's all I got to say. I mean, if that's, if that's not the standard, uh, then I'm not, uh, I'm not interested for the most part. That's where I'm at. All right, fair enough. Well, Shane, uh, thanks for coming on and talking about all this. If our listeners wanted to hear more from you, where could they go? Well, I uh, am a part. I'm part of a, uh, a team here, um, and we have a presence on YouTube and Twitch. Both uh, we're called the Asylum Cerberus on Twitch. You can find us at uh, the underscore uh, the Asylum. So the underscore Asylum underscore Cerberus, uh, and on YouTube we have the same name. Uh, we do live streams and, uh, there's three of us and, uh, we do, you know, game commentary, we do playthroughs, uh, and then we also, at the end, we do comedy sketches too. We have two series that we've done. Um, we've done, uh, readings from Urban Dictionary and we've done, uh, Fortress of Solid Dudes, which we actually just wrapped up. We had a lot of fun with that and we're currently undergoing our biz biggest project. Uh, it's, uh, I can't really talk too much about it, but... Uh, we're going to be making a proper um, kind of like a web show. Like it's going to be a full, it's not just a sketch. We're actually doing a legitimate show uh, and we're starting to put the pieces together there. And, uh, you know, as, as uh, we get a little bit closer towards release for that, we'll start opening up uh, more and more details about it. But uh, yeah, that's what we're doing over there. We're, we're keeping ourselves busy. All right. That sounds great. Well, uh, hopefully we can get you back on the show again. I'm sure I'll be on your show sometime soon. Absolutely. Yeah, we uh, we have a game uh, discussion. It's done in the format of a podcast, but we generally do it over a live stream on Hangouts. Uh, it's called Within the Asylum. It's where we kind of drop the goofiness and we uh, talk about something that's relevant in the gaming industry. So 
and Jeremy, we were actually on our, uh, our, our second episode of that when we discussed AAA uh, gaming and, and all that good stuff. Yep. Well, once again, thanks for uh, coming on, Shane. Yep. Yeah, happy to do it. And that'll wrap up episode two of Just Another Video Game Podcast. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. 